In the psychology of the modern civilized human, it is difficult to overstate the significance of the house. From as early as the Neolithic era, mankind has defined itself by its buildings. Buildings for washing, buildings for socializing, buildings for protection, even buildings for the commemoration of the dead. But of all the structures that mankind has invented for itself, there is little doubt that it is the house which it relies upon most for its continued survival. The house is one of the key elements that separates modern humanity from its more primitive progenitors. No other creature goes to such lengths to create permanent shelter for itself, nor regards such shelter with such reverence and import. Why do human beings of our modern age foster this tremendous sympathy for their homes? There are many reasons, of course, but perhaps it is due in some small part to seeing them as a reflection of ourselves. The anatomy of the house is such that the comparison is less superficial than at first it may seem. To carry it further, if we were to dissect the house as we would a human cadaver, we would find ourselves able to isolate and describe its various appendages and their functions in a decidedly anatomical fashion. There is even a fair number of direct comparisons to be drawn between those organs of a house and those of a human body. For example, let us examine the living room. Often the dominant space of the house at ground level, as well as typically the center of activity in a well-populated home, the living room is very much the heart of the house. While a human heart circulates blood to bring oxygen to the extremities, the living room circulates people, activities, communication. It is the room most likely to be found beating as active and lively as its name would imply. The comparison is only strengthened when we consider also that the living room was most commonly the room to contain the fireplace, making it additionally a locus of actual physical heat. It is easy to think of the kitchen and dining room as the stomach or digestive system of the house, but this comparison is tenuous. By contrast, the function and analog of a bathroom should be immediately obvious. The hallways and corridors of a house are its veins, providing circulation coursing throughout its frame. A staircase bears more than a passing resemblance, both physically and symbolically, to a spine. The windows of a house serve much the same purpose as eyes, and anyone who has ever rounded a bend or a long drive and came suddenly face to face with a tall, dark manor would tell you that it is difficult to shake the impression that the house, through its lifeless windows, is a creature capable of vision and intelligence. The bedroom is perhaps the room that most eludes direct comparison in this fashion, at a stretch and allowing for a bit of poetic sympathy. It may be said that the bedroom is not unlike the human mind. That is the part which dictates thought and imagination. In the bedroom, dreams are dreamt, passions are ignited, epiphanies are experienced in cold sweat at early hours. In the bedroom is where people invariably spend the majority of their time, though comparatively little of it whilst conscious. And yet this analogy is an incomplete one, for obviously the mind is an exceedingly complex thing. If the bedroom represents the thinking, dreaming part of the brain, then it is the basement that represents the more unconscious part. The basement is dark. It is buried. It is a place full of cobwebs where memories are stored. A poignant comparison, truly, 
often the unnerving uncertainty that comes with considering the deeper aspects of the human psyche is not unlike gazing down at the swimming blackness pulled at the bottom of a basement stairwell. It is a place we spend our childhood filling with monsters that will lay for years in patient quiet. It is a place where, barring some specific errand, we seldom ever want to go. Of course, this comparison, though appropriate, is a very heavy-handed one, and often the basement is little more than a storage space littered with the corpses of spiders. While poets and psychoanalysts no doubt dread the thought of a dark basement, in truth, it is the bedroom, the waking mind, that place of dreams, which is actually the most frightening of all. It is here, in the bedroom, that we are at our most vulnerable. Each night we shut our senses to the world for hours at a time, trusting in the house to keep us safe until next we wake. In the state of extreme vulnerability, we will spend something like 20% of our lives Anything could stand beside us, watch us, keep us company until dawn, and we would never perceive it. We can only pray that the house will not such things carry on as we sleep. In this way, during these hours, the bedroom seems less like a mind and more like a mouth for it is here that the house is most likely to betray us. It is here that we place ourselves most at the house's mercy and spend each night hoping that it will not bite down. But what happens to a house when it is left alone? When it becomes worn and aged? When its paint peels and its foundations begin to sink? When it goes for too long unlived in? What does it think of? What does it dream? How does it regard those creatures who built it, brought it into existence, only to abandon it when its usefulness no longer satisfies them? It may grow lonesome. It may stare for long hours into the darkness, its own empty halls and see shadows. And its heart may jump as it thinks, here, Hear someone again, I'm not alone. And each time it is wrong, and the hurt starts over. It may haunt itself, inventing ghosts to walk its floors, making friends with its shadow puppets, laughing and whispering to itself at the end of some quiet cul-de-sac. It may grow angry. Its basement may fill with churning acid like an empty stomach, and its bile may rise as it asks itself through clenched teeth, What did I do wrong? It may grow bitter. It may grow hungry. So hungry and so bitter that its scruples dissolve and its doors unlock themselves. While a house may hunger, it cannot starve. And so, in fever and anger and loneliness, it may simply lie in wait. Doors open, shades drawn, always empty, hungry. The bedroom is perhaps the room that most eludes direct comparison in this fashion. At a stretch, and allowing for a bit of poetic sympathy. It may be said that the bedroom is not unlike the human mind. That is, the part which dictates thought and imagination. In the bedroom, dreams, 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 dr 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 dream that there are teeth, and they are all over me. And they're everywhere on me and in me, like cysts or spurs of bone. They're loose, but I can't move them because I have no hands. I look out through the bedroom window and see a truck approaching. A young man steps out, approaches, and enters through the front door. His body is covered in swollen ticks the size of quarters. 
He's walking through the downstairs hallway and laughing. He begins urinating on the wall and spits on the carpet. On they go through the first floor, breaking and maiming. There is an important distinction that must be drawn between the words dissection and vivisection, a distinction that appears to be lost on him. I invited him here to listen, and yet at every turn he has pried, he has prodded, and he has interfered. Was he not paying attention, paying attention? Did it not occur to him that when you cut into an organism, it would be felt? And still, he harassed. He goes to the basement and stands at the top of the stairs. I'm angry at him, so I slam the door. And he falls down. I can feel his bones. Snapping. The ticks are bursting, oozing oil, black blood everywhere. I can feel him being ground up dissolved and torn, splitting and shredding, but I leave the door closed, and I close my eyes and try to sleep. The teeth continue growing until there's nothing left underneath but teeth and gums and sinew, because when a house is both hungry and awake, every room becomes a mouth.